the Twin Cities, it's Good Company. With your hosts, Steve Adelman and Sharon Anderson. With roving reporter Gary Lumpkin and the Good Company Company. We got a couple of great groups out in the audience. We'll be mentioning them a little later on. We got a lot of high energy going on here today. A lot uh, of high energy. You a lot bet. Of high energy. I'm Gary Lumpkin, and this is Gary Schindel. That's we're, right. We're not normally here. As a matter of fact, we're not normally anywhere in the same place together. We, we travel out in the field and usually leave these spots to Steve and Sharon, but they're down in Florida these days. And they say that they are having a good time in the sunshine. Yes. Yeah. Lucky them, huh? That's exactly right. We're going to have some good. Uh, we're going to have some good times out in this kind of weather. You know, these days where you have a real nice day and then a real cold day. You know, we've been having those lately. Sometimes it, we can really feel bad about that. But there's a place, Cambridge, Minnesota. We're going to be going there a little later on, where they just love it, and they love it because that makes for some great maple syrup. That's hot, later on. Hot and cold, hot and cold. They like that. That's exactly right. Yeah. You know, we talked about Steve and Sharon, and I know they're getting a little rest on their uh, vacation. And I wonder if they're getting any exercise. I doubt it. I Maybe doubt some it. of this, eating and a little of this, putting on their, their suntan lotion. <coughs> I'm a little they, jealous. Well, when they come back, they better watch our next story. Because let me show you what happened when we visit a very special infant exercise class at the St. Paul YWCA. Now, it's a class that's been going for some time, and it's extremely popular. Once a week, these new mothers and their babies attend a one-hour infant exercise class at the St. Paul YWCA. Each session begins with the moms massaging the babies. Certainly a most pleasurable activity for everyone involved. The instructor, Renee Bruce, is a child development specialist, and she demonstrates on a doll exactly what the mothers should do. Now, the purpose of the massage is to relax the babies and remove any tension they might have in their muscles. This is important since the next phase calls for mom to move the limbs around and really stretch those muscles out. The idea here is to counteract the effects of the babies being in the fetal position for prolonged periods of time. Good for the baby? <laughs> you betcha. But the class is really designed to give... Quality experience with the mother. One of the best experiences that they can, you know, have. The, the moms are talking with the babies, cooing with the babies, touching the babies the whole time that we're in the class. Yeah. 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 <laughs> it also tones the muscles. Uh, the massage that we do helps relieve some tension in the babies. Uh, it's especially good to be done at night. You know, we're hoping that the things that we're doing here, that they're continuing at home. What do you think you're getting out of this? Well, I think it's good for her. It's a time that we can be together and enjoy each other. And my husband and uh, she went to the father baby exercise class at the hospital when she was a month old. And I thought it would be good that we continued it. The next part of the class time is spent using a variety of apparatus. Apparatus designed to strengthen the skeletal muscles to develop the posture. Well, it's obvious that mothers and babies enjoy the activities, but they all have a purpose. Here on the big beach ball, for example, the idea is to get the baby to strengthen its neck so she can lift her head. It works pretty good, too. The class has been going for about 30 minutes now, and it's been fun, but now, it's time for a 10 minute rest period and a little nourishment, of course, since there is still a lot more to come. Well, it's been a busy schedule, but it's not over because after a hard workout and a little lunch, it's time to sit back and relax and watch mom. Ten, two, three, four. The final 30 minutes of class is devoted to getting the new moms back into shape. It's an exercise class designed especially for new mothers and their special needs. Well, you have to take into consideration that um, they're going to be probably working at a little slower pace than most of the exercise classes that we've done. And we work a lot with the stomach muscles and the pelvic muscles. 
to try and get those back into shape because naturally those will be the weakest. Eventually, the class will be doing a vigorous aerobic workout, but for now, these exercises will do just fine. <laughs> Meanwhile, the little ones enjoy watching their mom's efforts and stare intently at the action. Well, most of them do anyway. Looking right there at a youngster that is a very happy baby indeed. And uh, I want to mention that the YWCA has a variety of programs. What makes this one especially nice is that the mothers and babies can be together all the time. And if there are older children, there's also a daycare center available. But now taking a look at that little youngster right there, he was such a joy that we asked he and mom to come on to the show with us today. And they are here with us. This is uh, Trisha Bragstad and Christopher. Welcome to the show. Thank you very much. We're glad to be here. Well, I must ask you that uh, the class was uh, certainly enjoyable. We got that very clearly from Christopher. But what were you getting out of it? What have you gotten out of the class? Well, I think one thing I got out of it was improved muscle tone. You saw us exercising in the last part, and we really do get a workout. But more than that, uh, Christopher just gained so much socially from the class. And it was just fun being there with him and sharing that. You know, it, it's hard to imagine. Uh, he's just barely six months now. Right. And the class was eight weeks. Right. Someone that small, and they can even start younger, really benefiting from, from, from this class. But you've noticed improvements? Specifically, what have you noticed? Well, from the very first class, he spent most of the time during while we were exercising looking at little Lindsay next to him. So he just <laughs> loves seeing the other babies. It just makes him so excited. And we've learned exercises that we do with him at home. He also loves this microphone, I can tell that right now. <laughs> yes, he does. While the, while the tape was running, he was making some good sounds. Do you have anything you want to add to this, Christopher? <laughs> well, maybe not. Huh? He'll, just, he'll just eat it. <laughs> the, um, uh, the program now is designed for up to age six months. And, right. And now he's, he is a graduate of the program. What does yes. he do next? Well, next he starts swimming. Um, the end of this month, he'll start a swimming class, which I'm excited about because my husband will be able to join us, too. It's a Wednesday evening class. And he'll also take gym babes, which is a continuation in the sort of exercises that you saw there, but for how, the older baby. Okay. How, how about you? Um, uh, do you think you got in, in pretty good shape in just the, the, the short workouts? Because they were f fairly short, weren't they? They were short, but it, after you get sore muscles, you realize what bad shape you're in. So it stimulates you to, to work out on your own. Yeah, because I know the class, as we mentioned, was designed for new moms and a special right. set of exercises. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I want to thank you for being here, and I want to mention one other thing as well, too, that the St. Paul YWCA has a special sample day coming up, um, I believe it's Monday, March 14th, and there's a uh, name and address and phone number. It's at the St. Paul YM, uh, YWCA. Phone number is 222-3741, and, and the sample day means everything is free, all of the activities, all the facilities, and you can go and, and see exactly what's offered. Thank you very much for being here, and we'll be right back with more Good Company. guy Steve and Sharon left and they have put Gary and Gary the two guys who go out side to get stories in the kitchen we're gonna try to cook this could this could set kitchen back a hundred years that's right the culinary arts may be in for a tough time but we are going to do something that maybe you face if, if you're a, if you're a husband out there watching your wife leaves and you're stuck with the kids what the heck do I make or better yet what can I teach the kids to make me huh Maybe, maybe we've got a chance here because this is very simple. I'll tell you, yeah, we're going to put together something called confetti beans. Now, neither of us know beans about cooking, but we are going to put together <laughs> confetti pork and beans. Now, I mean, you know, that's, this is it for the bachelors, right? Okay. I know we start with pork and beans. That's right. Now, what you do is you start with a two and a half quart uh, 
uh, bean pot. Looks something like this. I don't know what two and a half quarts is. Anyway, you get one about this size, right? And you fill it with two cans of whatever beans that happen to be left in the house, right? Just the old standard pork and beans. Now, we are going to create, Mr. Lumpkin. Are you ready? There's more. You bet. All right. Now, what you do is in that two and a half quart casserole, you combine those two cans of pork and beans like we see there with three quarters of a cup of brown sugar. All right, they got this measured for us. All right. Three quarters of a cup of brown sugar. Yeah, go ahead and stir. I'm not doing this okay. alone. All right, I'll all right. This, I'm the stirring party. Okay, now what we're going to put in is we're going to put in three quarters of a cup evaporated milk. That's the stuff that comes in the can that's sitting up in the shelf. Okay. All right, it's a little thicker. Oh, my God. There it goes. Oh, you're doing wonderfully. Okay, now this, this folks, is confetti beans. In a minute, we're going to be telling you why it's confetti. Oh, hey, that looks great. We just lost the back half of the audience there. Ooh, now doesn't this look great? All right, three, three tablespoons mustard. Are you ready? <laughs> now, if you have a dog at home, well, no. Okay, well, anyway. No. Now, my wife always tells me texture is the important thing in foods, texture. You know what, this, 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 is, this has texture. Yeah, it's, it looks like wallpaper paste, doesn't it? Wallpaper paste. Okay, I'm All gonna right. turn this over to you because okay. I know next become, comes onions. That's right. And you now, now, folks, trust me, this is gonna turn out delicious regardless, okay? Now, we, had so, we hired somebody to chop the onions because we Thank couldn't goodness. afford the tears. All right. Now, Sliced what, and diced. Yes, one small chopped onion is what you put in there. Okay. Okay. Uh, don't look at this, everybody. Okay. There you are. All right. Now, why do we call it confetti beans? Ah. All right, here we're going to show you. One quarter of a cup chopped pimento, which is red. Throw the red in there, Mr. There's the Mr. Red. Lumpkin. There you go. Oh, Here's let's the... move it around a bit. Okay. Now, not only that. Okay, there's the red. Now, let's put some green in there. In the this same case... amount. Yeah, a quarter of a cup chopped green pepper. All right. Okay. Red and green. All right. Onions. There Mustard, brown sugar, That's right. evaporated milk, and beans. And frankly, I think you could use something else. And what is it? What are we going to put in there? Frank's. Frank's right. right. There you go. Okay. okay. Now, now what we're going to do not is just chop these any out. Frankfurters, though. Well you, you, well, you can use whatever happens to be on hand. I mean, the idea is this is supposed to be simple. Now, wait a minute. Hold it. Hold it. You're supposed to chop these diagonally, guy. Wait a minute. All right. All right. We got enough hands in here? Diagonally. Well, see, diagonally to you this way is diagonally the same to me this way. No, that's, you're going straight here. No, you see, there you go. All right. It, right, we really got to get. Do you know? Do you happen to know why it's diagonally? Yes. So you release more flavor. Plus, it looks cute. All right. Okay. Plus, I'm trying to make things hard should, for you. Should me. you take them out of the package first? Yes. Yeah. Get rid of that thing. Okay. Okay. All right. We spent years and years in the kitchen. Don't let this fool you, because we know exactly what we're doing at all times. All okay. Right. Diagonally sliced. That. You got hot dogs, okay. wieners, frankfurters. Here we go. All right. Toss them in there, big. There we okay. are. Okay. Toss them in there. Okay. Now what we're going to do is we're going to bake this at three and a quarter, and for 25 minutes, you're, oh, oh that looks wonderful. All this is right. good stuff now. There's your pound of Frank sliced, of course, diagonally. <laughs> you bet. And now we've got it all mixed up. Now, 25 minutes, you put this in the oven and let it bake away, all right? At 325 degrees. That's right, 325. And what's gonna happen is, you take it out of there. Take it out. Okay, be careful with the pot holders and everything. Okay, then. And what you want to do is you put a, want to put a little garnish on top. Make it look great. Now, if you want to make this for mom when she gets back, here's what you do. You take a piece of cheese. All right, now, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let's sliced diagonally. Sliced diagonally. <laughs> okay, there they are. Oh, this is looking so good. Oh, my goodness. That was close. Okay, more cheese. More cheese. All right. You put that in there. Somewhere goes in there like that. Now we're having fun. And right. then the real coup de gras. That's right. Little, uh, little see green now, uh, see why peppers. It, yeah, confetti beans because it's so colorful. We got red and green and some cheese in there. Put it back in there, let the cheese melt a bit. That's right, just long enough to let the cheese melt. So that'd be another, what, five minutes or so? And look, and look at this get. creation. Now look at what we made earlier, huh? Now that is, oh, that's Can pretty good looking pretty stuff. Good? Yeah. Yeah, all right. Can we, uh, can we dish this up? I think I'm gonna okay. let you do the dishing. All right. So like a couple of bachelors here left, left to ourselves, we get beans. But these are pretty good beans. At least uh, that they're supposed to be. Melted cheese. Oh, yeah. yeah. Ooh, see all that. Uh -oh, there's one that's not cut diagonally. <laughs> I think we've kind of probably beat that to death, don't you think? We've okay. let that lie. Well, you ready, you ready to taste? Go ahead. Okay. You get the first taste. All right. That's pretty good. I'm telling you. I, I'm not, I like it. I'm not a real big pimento and, and uh, green pepper fan, but... Uh, I like it. I'll tell you the truth. What do you think? 
That's good. The, um, it's, it's, it's a little bit sweet. Maybe it's the brown sugar. Or yeah, the brown sugar adds something. The onions add a, add a little bite to it, as do the peppers, and it just spices it up just a little bit. You know, people think when we get up here that we're just fooling around that we have to say it tastes good, right? Right. That's not true. No. Ma'am, would you man just come up here, please? Come on. Right here. Come on up. Okay, just come right here. Now this this is a lady who looks like she knows how to. You cook. were laughing. <laughs> you were laughing at us, and now we're going to put. You, what is your name, please? Well, Dorothy, now wait a second. Dorothy, come on. Here we go. Dorothy. Here, here ready, it comes. Dorothy? Here it comes, Dorothy. Okay. How long here, is it? here comes the train. <laughs> All right. Delicious. Delicious. Now see, thank you very much, Dorothy. An unsolicited. An uh, unsolicited. You can Let's take. Hand, you can take this home with you. And, and people think we make this up. Isn't I can't, that amazing? Boy, she looked like she was just so welcome to get that, wasn't it? <laughs> That'll teach her to laugh at us, huh? That's exactly right. Say, if you want to get this recipe, and who wouldn't for confetti beans, here is where you write. You send that st self-addressed, stamped envelope, don't cut it diagonally, to Good Company Recipes. That's in care of KSTP, 3415 University Avenue, St. Paul, Minnesota, 55114. Send that self-addressed, stamped envelope, and you can, too, can get confetti beans. When we come back, we're going to talk about video games. Are they harmless, or are they a harmful addiction? Serious question. Stay with us. Tomorrow on Good Company, the man we all remember from Camelot, Robert Goulet, will be here to guest host the show. And a Good Company viewer gets a beauty makeover in order to surprise her husband. Also tomorrow, we'll meet Rafe of One Life to Live, actor Ken Meeker. Coming up next, we'll find out what effects video games have on our kids. Now, are your kids dazzled by Defender, possessed by Pac-Man? Do you know what we're talking about? We're talking about video games. And recently, there's been some concern that video games that started off as kind of a harmless little preoccupation in the arcades may be kind of a harmful addiction. Well, there's been a study done here in the state of Minnesota that has some surprising results. And one of the people who involved, was involved with that is Tom Lombard, who is with the Minnesota Department of Education. He's a specialist in psycho psychological services. And we are going to ask the question, are video games harmful or harmless? Now, Tom, why the concern about this? Well, there are several reasons that we got involved with it. Uh, first of all, the Surgeon General, Dr. Koop, uh, issued a statement uh, condemning video games, felt that they were harmful for the heart and soul and addictive for the youth of America. Addictive? Now, that's a strong word. Uh, that's a term that he used, and uh, it's a pretty strong term. It's usually associated with other... Uh, uh, dependencies of a pretty serious nature, so that got our first attention. And also some other word out of Rochester as well. It was kind well, of scary. That's right. At the Mayo Clinic uh, about a month ago, there was a uh, an article published in the Journal of uh, the American Medical Association about two uh, teenagers, two boys that were uh, found to have seizures induced by uh, uh, playing video games. The significance of that finding was that the, n neither of those two boys had a history of seizures before before those, playing those games before those episodes. So that that got our attention. Of course, we keep, got to keep in rem remember it. Just two people, though. That's right. And the, when we talked to the Mayo Clinic about that, they uh, uh, really emphasized the point that it's just a few kids, and and that they're not trying to alarm the public that there is uh, any large scale uh, likelihood of. Uh, you know, of many kids developing those symptoms. So, Tom, the concern is obviously there about video games. And what we did uh, was we asked some Twin Cities people what they thought about video games. Are they harmless or could they cause harm to the younger generation? Here's what they said. <laughs> trying to get the, get the things and killing and stuff. The main thing when my son or daughter, God, especially my son, wants to do is play video games. It's always dad, give me a quarter, give me a dollar, and you know how that goes. Uh, I don't think it really harms them. I think they maybe spend a little more money on them, but as far as harming, no, I don't think so. I think it keeps them out of trouble.
strengthens their mental agility. It gives them the ability to calculate things and to uh, uh, use their brain a little bit more than they normally would playing games like Monopoly and things like that. So uh, I, I think it's a positive vein to everything that a child does. It teaches them how to grow a little bit. A lot of kids I know are skipping school just to go out to the arcades and play video games all the time, waste their money, rip off money from their parents just to play them. I definitely think it's something should be done about it. I get my money, the money from my allowance and from mowing lawns, doing odd jobs. I get the money from my allowance. Well, it's kind of wasting money, but I think it's fun. Also, when I get mad, I like coming here and blowing up things. Gets a little of the pressure off. And it seems every week there is a new video game where you can blow up something new. And sometimes moms would like to blow up those screens. They say, gee, my son's eyes are turning into video screens. But the Minnesota Department of Education has done a survey that actually took a look at how harmful these games are. And Tom Lombard, who is with us, what did you find out? Well, uh, we surveyed school psychologists uh, in the state of Minnesota, and the basic uh, purpose of the survey was to find out whether they were observing any uh, negative psychological effects, and if so, what, what kinds of effects. And it was pretty clear that there uh, is no evidence of a large-scale problem. Uh, however, at the same time, uh, there were psychologists who did report some kids do have uh, problems uh, playing the games, uh, different uh, kinds of problems, different kinds of effects, but uh, there, there is some concern in some quarters, but it's not a large-scale problem. So it isn't a big thing. Now, if I'm a parent, does that mean I should be concerned if my son is spending a little time at the video arcade? Well, um, like with the, so many other kinds of activities, whether you're talking athletics or um, uh, other kinds of recreational activities, you know, it's possible to spend uh, too much time on them. And I don't think uh, video games are any different in that respect. You mean like, like going out for band or maybe uh, on, being on the football team? Those two can be consuming. Well, th those uh, activities have a little more social acceptability to them. Right. Uh, some people associate uh, playing uh, uh, arcade games and video arcades is similar to pool halls. And pool hall image is sort of a negative connotation to it. So uh, w to compare playing uh, the video games with uh, school-related activities is, is, a little, is a little different. But the same idea applies, though, that uh, they can uh, occupy too much of a, of a kid's time. And it, uh, ha that is happening to some extent. Now, one of the things that I think is, is peculiar to video games is this penchant that some of them have for violence. Somebody going and running over. There have been games where you run over people or hit them with your tanks, uh, killing and all sorts of things. Can that be harmful? Well, uh, one of the reasons that I was interested in surveying the psychologist was I, had a, I felt that it was. Uh, I felt that uh, some of the games, particularly the early ones, had uh, a very pronounced theme on violence. And I had observed some behavior in arcades that uh, I felt, uh, well, will this behavior generalize outside the arcade setting? Uh, it does bring out some uh, aggressive uh, thinking and perhaps even a preoccupation with uh, aggression. So we had the question. Uh, some of the games certainly do play on that. But I think the, uh, a remarkable thing, uh, there has been quite a bit of attention played to the violence aspect of it. And in the last year, there's just been an enormous turnaround in the theme for new games that are coming out. In other words, the manufacturers are, are making a change that way. It certainly appears that way. The, the new games that are coming out don't have violence as a theme, don't have shoot 'em up bang bang types of themes. Uh, they really uh, uh, seem to be putting a premium on entertainment. That's We're right. talking with Tom Lombard, who's done a, uh, a study on video games. Are they harmful? And when we come back, we are going to give you a list, if you are a mom or dad concerned about this. Is your son a video addict or your daughter? We're going to have a checklist for you when we return. Stay with us. are speaking with Tom Lombard from the Minnesota Department of Education talking about video games. Are they harmful? They have done a survey to find out. And one of the things, Tom, you put together was a checklist of things that parents can watch out for to see if maybe your son or daughter is getting a little too hooked on video games. Let's take a look at some of those and I think it's a good checklist for any parent. 
First of all, you say loss of consciousness while playing. Now, that's pretty scary, Tom. Well, there are the, uh, some children who, uh, who have uh, the two cases in the Mayo Clinic who have gone into seizures and loss of consciousness is preliminary to that. Is that kind of like a trance-like state where you're just riveted to the to screen? I've seen that some places. Uh, yeah, that would be a good description. Or of is it more like out. tuning out like we just see right here? Uh, blacking out uh, or temporary disorientation would be another example. Uh, uh, no, obsession with the game theme is an important, uh, more Now, how would I see that as a parent? Well, if your child just is playing the game when the game's turned off. Oh, you know, really? If uh, they're obsessed with the characters in the game, uh, so that they're, you know, making like uh, they're <laughs> present right there. So mom and dad become winky and blinky and sister is, is, is stinky or whatever it is in Pac-Man, <laughs> Pac huh? Now, what, now, some of these other things. Most of the time spent on the game. In other words, if they're spending their evenings playing the game or off at the arcade. Well, an inordinate amount of time. Yeah, and, and the final one, obviously, would be a signal. Stealing money to play games. Right, if you're finding money missing from your wallet or your, or your purse, that's a sign. Okay, those are warning signs, and I think Gary has some questions. We sure do. This man has a question for Tom. Uh, Tom, you mentioned there was a study done, and I'm wondering if there was anything positive discovered about the games, like improving a child's concentration. Well, we didn't have any report of that. Uh, uh, I talked with some of the psychologists who did respond to it, and many of them feel that it does improve eye-hand coordination. Uh, and it, uh, interestingly, some, uh, some people felt that they were uh, uh, a benefit because it kept them out of trouble, or it, it kept them in an area where they uh, uh, weren't doing other activities that were less desirable because they consumed such a large amount of time. Thank you. Now we have another question here as well about placement, right? Right. Are there any regulations set up as to where the video games can be installed? There are none that I know of uh, at the state level. There are at a local level uh, licensing of uh, businesses. And I have read some articles in local papers uh, where they've tried to control when the hours of operation are because there is an inclination for kids to skip school to play if they're open during the school hours. So uh, there has been some attempt at a local level in cities and communities to control the uh, operating hours, but not necessarily the content of the games. I haven't uh, observed any, any real in-depth uh, attempt to control them. We have another question up here. Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I was just wondering if you've ever actually played any of the video games yourself. Uh, only for research purposes. <laughs> All right, thanks. Uh, well, now let me ask you a question. Uh, do you play video games? Yeah, quite a bit. What do you, what do you think about this? Do you, do you see potential hazards? No, well, I just think maybe if the kids are like unstable or something, but I don't, I don't really think so, no. What about the other side of it? Have you gained anything by it, do you think? Well, it's fun. I did not really know. Okay, good. Gary? Yes, we have another question here. I was wondering if um, you have arrived at a definite conclusion if it's okay or not okay. I could give you my opinion on that, uh, and, and others might disagree. The Surgeon General might disagree, for example, but in my opinion, they are not a problem for most children. There are a few children who are going to have a problem playing, and parents should be concerned. The low seizure threshold idea that is something that they simply have to be aware of, although it's not going to affect many families. We have, an, we have another question over here. Yes, sir. Yes, why does this tend to be a boys' game and not you don't see many girls participating in it? That's true, isn't it? Uh, in the arcades, in fact, in the taped piece we showed, uh, it was almost exclusively boys, wasn't it? What about that? Uh, I don't know why, except that perhaps boys have more, perhaps more opportunity to earn money to play. Um, that, that's one thing that occurs to me is why, why young, we're talking about school age kids, why there may be more boys than girls. Other than that, I really don't have any idea. There, there doesn't seem to be anything innate in the games themselves that naturally appeal to a male uh, than a female. Well, I was going to not mention that, but I, knew, I do know some psychologists, colleagues of mine, who feel that there is more of a of uh, an instinctive urge for uh, aggression in males and in females. Therefore, the aggressive games would be more attractive to males. What do you think about that? Do you think males are more uh, being well, more aggressive, I think, therefore? I think it appeals to the aggressive part of a male, yes. Macho, you know, he's, he's the one that likes the war and you know, shooting down the airplane. Now, I asked the other young man up in the uh, audience if he ever played a game. How about you? Have you ever played any video games? Well, I would if I was younger, <laughs> but I can't see. <laughs> no reaction now. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Gary? Yes. One last, one last thing, Tom. Kind of a yes or no answer. Is this a passing fad? No. 
It won't be. No. We're going to have them 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Five so years from now. Yes. So that study is very important. Tom Lombard with some important thoughts on video games. When we come back, we are going to be traveling to Cambridge, Minnesota. We are going to look at the maple sap and do a little curling. Stay with us. Next week on Good Company, on Monday, the queen of household hints, Mary Ellen Pinkham, will be here live in our studio. Tuesday, field host Gary Lumpkin visits a special hockey school in the Twin Cities. This one's between hockey-playing moms and their sons. On Wednesday, we'll have some more of that Good Company specialty, the Super Bargain. Coming up next, we'll travel to Cambridge, Minnesota. talking earlier about how March can be kind of a cruel month in the state of Minnesota. Remember earlier, I think it was last week, we had 60 degree temperatures, and now it's pretty chilly out there today. I'm actually a little confused about that because uh, March is supposed to come in like a lion, go out like a lamb, or vice versa, and it's kind of come in both ways, right? Uh, That's right. Lamb and a lion. So what does that mean? I think it means we're terribly confused in this state. We have some of the strangest weather in the whole United States here in Minnesota. But you know, on today's Minnesota getaway, we're going to go to a place where they love that kind of weather. Because when it gets cold and then warm, that means that the sap is running. And it's like I say, the town is Cambridge, and we are going to be going there now and take a look at the place where the sap is running, and they are having a good time. Also, we're going to take a look at some curling as well. Now, we may be premature, but on today's Minnesota getaway, we are going to celebrate the spring thaw. To do that, we have come to Cambridge, which is home to 3,100 folks north of the Twin Cities in Isandee County. Now, we've come here because in Cambridge, the spring thaw is sweet news. Literally, sweet news. That's because Cambridge is maple syrup country, and those warm temperatures start the sap flowing. In the woods all around town, the maples are awakening again, and they yield Minnesota's sweetest natural treasure, sap that makes pure maple syrup. And then I think we'll work all the way up on it. You get these all laid out there. For farmer Vern Jardine yeah, and his son here. Chip, this is a busy time. When his maples are flowing with sap, Vern Jardine knows it's a good sign. Uh, I think it's one of the best indications of springtime. It's when you see the water running along the road, then it's time to be out in the woods. Should have been there. And what kind of year will this be? Well, I look for it to be a good year because uh, the ground isn't froze first place. It's uh, early, so we can get, have a chance of getting a longer season. I think it'll be a good year. You look like you're smiling. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who wouldn't when the sap's running? For most of us, the idea of collecting maple sap conjures up images of courier and ives, draft horses, and trees lined with tin buckets. But like everything else, it's changed. The horses and those quaint little tin buckets have been replaced by plastic. This green tubing that runs out of the tree and then down into a larger main line that runs out to the road for collection. And what this system lacks in charm, it makes up for in quality. It's a labor saver. You don't have to be going in the woods with tractors and equipment to haul the stuff out, or you don't have to uh, handle it by hand. We run it through the tubing into main lines and then use pumps and pump it into tanks. So we eliminate a lot of hard work. Also, the sap stays clean. No bugs or leaves can get into it. And it's fresher when Vern gets it back to his farm, and that makes for better flavor. As it comes from the tree, maple sap looks almost exactly like water. To turn the sap into syrup, you simply boil the water out. But you have to boil and boil and boil, and that's a lot of toil and trouble. It takes about 30 gallons of sap to make just one gallon of maple syrup. These days, the steam hangs heavy around the Jardine farm as they keep pouring more wood onto the fire and turning more sap into delectable syrup. In a good year, Vern's trees yield about 400 gallons of syrup, and this is going to be a good year. By now, I have probably whet your appetite for maple syrup. So how do you get some? Well, Vern Jardine says you are welcome to come on up to Cambridge and buy some straight off the farm. It isn't cheap. A little jug like this costs $3.25. But it is delicious. And there are some places right here in Cambridge where you can put this to good use. 
On pancakes, of course. If you come to Cambridge in the morning, try this place, called appropriately, in a town that turns out maple syrup, Flapjack County. Of course, any place calling itself Flapjack County has to specialize in breakfast. But lunch and dinner are good here, too. Everything from inexpensive burgers for the whole family to complete dinners. And let Gary Lumpkin lose as much weight as he wants. This is the kind of Cambridge diet that I like. Now, we got to get moving on, because out at the fairgrounds, there is a special appearance by the stones. Not the rolling stones, but the sliding stones. By now, you must know that we're curling. You know, the sport that's a little like shuffleboard and bowling and darts and house cleaning all combined into one. The town of Cambridge got into curling just eight or nine years ago, but already this club has about 200 members and the rink stays busy almost every night. What's the appeal? Once you've tried it, you're hooked. When you first see curling, you aren't real impressed with the, the strategy behind it, but once you've curled for a, for a short period of time, you begin to understand a little bit more of the game and out with your friends a lot. The nice thing about curling is you can do it all your life. I don't have time to explain all about hacks and houses and dead rocks, but the object of curling is to land your team's stone closest to the bullseye in the ice. The sweeping? Well, that temporarily melts the ice just a bit, makes it slicker, and allows the stone to travel further. Once you let go, it's the only control you've got. Folks take their curling seriously here, but they say the best part of the sport is just spending some time with your friends, and Cambridge is a good place for friends. There's a lot of things going on in Cambridge, and uh, we enjoy the community, and we're close enough to the city so we can go down and get our culture every once in a while, and we still come back here and, and uh, relax and, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in our lifestyle. And people from the cities can come on up and get a dose of curling. That's right. Last shot, huh? Your turn. My turn, okay. Well, after spending a few hours in Cambridge, I have found out that you can have a good time here. If you, if you like it sticky, come on up for the maple syrup. And if you like things smooth as ice, try curling. Good shot, Gary. All <laughs> right. <laughs> Ah, it's an easy sport, huh, folks? Well, if you want to get to Cambridge, here's how. You go up Route 65 and to uh, Cambridge. It's about 45 miles, and it's just north, as we say, in Isanti County. Now, 45 miles takes about an hour to get there. It'll cost you about a half a tank of gas to get there, and uh, you will have a good time in Cambridge. I'll tell you. What do you think of that shot, huh, Gary? Not too bad. Now, uh, sometimes we shoot things not in the same order we show them. Did you have the flapjacks before the curling or after? I wonder, was that, was that fortified energy? That's, yeah, like I say, that's my Cambridge diet, and it allowed me to go out there and throw that stone right down the middle. It was wonderful. The, the extra energy, that's the, a flapjacks make you an expert curler at the same time. That's exactly right. And, but and I, I'm going to ignore the Cambridge diet crack. I, I'll pretend like we didn't <laughs> That was pretty clever. I've got to check with you, see how you're doing on that thing, by the way. But you know, that, it, it, really, it really is a nice town up there. Friendly folks. And the nice thing about curling is that you can sit around and talk, and you, know, you can uh, drink your maple syrup or whatever they drink at the curling rink. I'm not sure. But uh, that's the nice thing about curling is the sociability of it. It's a good town, Cambridge. Really ought to go there. Those uh, the Minnesota getaways, and we've both been doing them. They're a lot of fun, aren't they? Oh yeah, they are. It's just go to a town and have as much fun as you can, and hopefully share it with everybody. And like I said, go to Cambridge because I think you're going to have a good time. When we come back, we are going to be celebrating music in the state of Minnesota in the high school. Stay with us. Well, we're back again, and before we say goodbye, I think we should yeah. say thank you to some special groups that are in the audience. We have some people that came from 30 miles northwest of the Twin Cities in Albertville from the Albertville Golden Age. I want to thank you for coming. And also, the mass media students are here today from Totino Grace High School in Fridley. They are a good bunch. In friendly Fridley. That's exactly right. What a great town. You know, I've had fun here, sitting here for a little while, but we've got to get back out on the road here real soon. That's it. We're going to be wrapping this up and uh, heading to uh, whatever we're going to be doing. But on tomorrow's show... Join us for Robert Goulet, who will be here to help host the show. Yes, some enchanted people. Mr. I singing? Mr. Camelot. I mean, this guy is going to be here tomorrow, and he's great. Yeah. Yeah. Also coming up, we are going to have a beauty makeover, and this woman is... Psst.
pass this along. She's going to be surprising her husband with the makeover, and we're going to be showing you that. And Barbara Holmes will talk to us on Soap Talk to Rafe, an actor from One Life to Live. Like being on Soap Talk, like being in good company, and all of that and more tomorrow. That's right. Thank you. So, don't miss it. Bye-bye, everybody. So long. Transportation for the staff and crew of Good Company was provided by Republic Airlines. Republic flies to over 160 cities, from New York to California and from Canada to Mexico and the Caribbean. Republic flies to more cities than any airline in the country.